Good evening, everybody. I'm glad you're here. If you take some jewelry into a pawn shop to sell, and you say that it's gold, they're not just going to take your word for it. They'll have to do what they call an acid test. They take nitric acid, and they have a little dropper, and they'll drop the, the eyedropper you know, in an out-of-the-way place. And I'm trying to remember which way it goes. I think if it bubbles, that means that there is impurities and it's not pure gold. And if it doesn't, then if it doesn't bubble, then I think it's, it is pure gold. Or maybe the other way around. But they use this, the, the acid to prove if the gold is, is real. Now, next to acid, we think that water is a pretty harmless substance. But water actually has tremendous power and ability. And it can be used for tests as well. But water can, can do many things. It can cleanse, it can purify. But it can also, yes, uh, it, it can also uh, defile things and, and ruin them. We had a leak in our roof one time in our storage room, and there was a tub of books that had the little lids that kind of go like this together. Had some of my books in there that I hadn't put up on the shelf yet, and the leak in the roof was right over that tub, and it dripped water down there, and it ran down and found a corner of a crack. So there was a couple inches of water in the bottom of that, and I had to throw out some books. And if you know me, you know that that was a very painful and bitter exercise. So life can, or, or water can, it can cleanse things and purify them, but it can also ruin them. Water can save life if someone is uh, is dehydrated. Water can be used to heal and to revive them. Water can also take life. Someone can drown in water. It has a power both ways. Water can provide power, uh, like in the form of a, of a steam engine or a hydroelectric dam or something like that. It can, it can uh, have power to create and build things. Water can also destroy too much water. You know, if you get a flood, it'll destroy homes and, and buildings. Uh, water can cut canyons very quickly uh, when it's under tremendous force and power. Water can also provide a challenge. And it can provide a test, and that's what we'll be looking at tonight. This this particular power of water, and uh, the outline for this uh, for this lesson actually came from uh, from uh, R.C. White, a preacher from many many years ago, uh, who listed uh, these uh, these seven tests that we find in Scripture, where water was the, the means of that test. So we're going to be looking at several examples here how in the Bible that God uses water as a way to test mankind's faith and his trust and his obedience. And we'll look at what those examples mean for us. Uh, the first one we're going to be looking at is probably the most obvious and certainly the most dramatic. Uh, in the early pages of the Bible, we read about the flood, the flood of Noah. And this was a test. It was a test of trust, as we begin to see. Now, the Hebrew writer said in Hebrews chapter 11, as he, as he begins to list those great... Uh, those great people of faith. And when he gets to Noah, he says this about Noah in verse 7 of Hebrews 11. By faith Noah, being divinely born of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. So the, the ark was built to protect against things not seen. Well, it was... What was the thing not seen? Well, it was rain. Seemed odd to us, but let me just let me just ask you this: What if God revealed Himself to you and said that He was going to send judgment upon the earth and that He was going to fill the air with fire? That would be kind of difficult to imagine, wouldn't it? Or what if He said that the grass on the ground is going to be piled? miles deep. It would be hard to understand how that was going to happen, how that was going to work. Many scholars believe that Noah had likely never seen rain before. Uh, some think that it had not rained on the earth yet, that the earth was sustained by underground aquifers or perhaps a, a, a mist over the earth that, that kept the earth in, in that sort of tropical state before the flood sustained life that way, but, but either way, even if there was rain, uh, it certainly no one had ever seen anything 
like what was about to happen, where the fountains of the deep thrust up the water that was stored within them, and the, the windows of heaven, were told, were opened and poured out. Uh, nothing like this had ever been seen. And no one had ever seen a boat this big. There's even some speculation about whether people had built boats by then. Uh, but even if they had, they certainly had never engaged in the, the building of something this large. As a matter of fact, the dimensions of the ark that we have in the Bible, 450 feet long, man, modern man, we might say, had not built a water a, a water going vessel bigger than the ark until the year 1858 all through man's history even with the, the advancements in the uh, the industrial age and all of this man had not built a sea going vessel that was larger than the dimensions of the ark until 1858 so up until that time the ark was the biggest the biggest thing that man had ever built to to float on the water unheard of. There was a question, is this thing even going to float? Is it too big? Some said, well, the ark would never float because it's too big and the, the dimensions of it, it would just snap in half with the slightest wave motion and you can find any number of videos and studies and things like that on the internet to uh, talk about the feasibility of the ark. But just the common sense of it, imagine Noah looking and saying, is this thing even going to is, it, is this thing going to float and do what God said? Is it going to stay afloat for a year? It was a year before Noah and his family got out of the ark. I mean, we look at, I, I can look at a, at a huge steel battleship sitting in a port somewhere and think, how in the world does that thing float? You know, hundreds of thousands of tons of steel. Why does it just sink straight to the bottom? So it boggles the mind. Noah should be commended for his faith and his trust in God that God told him to build this and it was going to work. But the test of trust came really when the rain began. Would God really send the rain, first of all? Is this thing going to float? But, when it, but if it does, will God really do what he said? Earlier, God had said in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3, when he saw that man's heart had been turned to wickedness and Noah alone was the only righteous person around. God said that he would strive with man for 120 years. There, he said that was the time limit that God would, when in essence, put up with man's wickedness until he acted. So that starts the clock ticking. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 32, when we're introduced to Noah, it says that Noah fathered three sons beginning at the age of 500. So when Noah was 500 years old, he started having sons. Genesis 7 and verse 6 says that Noah was 600 years old when the flood came. So now we've got a 100-year period. Noah started having sons. And in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 18, Noah is told to take his wife and his sons and his sons' wives. So his sons, were at the time of the flood, were old enough to marry and have wives. Whatever, we, whatever age we put at that. So Noah, Noah had a 100-year period when he started having sons. If we leave time for the youngest son to be old enough to marry and have a wife, you know, if we say maybe 25 years, you know, starting from the oldest one and by the time the youngest one is old enough to marry, well, that cuts us down to about 75 years maybe. We're speculating, I understand. But he and his sons were building that ark. Think about that. Every day for 75 years, they're building that thing and thinking, is God really going to do this? Is the rain really going to come? Is this thing going to float? Building and preaching and wait. Well, Noah, thankfully for, for all of us who came from his descendants, Noah passed that test of trust. Now, the nation of Israel was going to face a different test by water, and theirs came at the Red Sea. After they'd come out of Egypt, they were at the shores of the Red Sea, and Pharaoh's army was closing in, and they thought they were all going to die. So Israel stands cowering at the shore. Now, they had just witnessed God visiting the ten plagues upon Egypt. They had just witnessed the mighty hand of God over the gods of Egypt. And that should have given them confidence. But they were still fearful. The test for them is, are they going to trust God? And are they going to go forward? The waters parted, and they went forward. They gathered their courage, and they obeyed God, and they walked through the Red Sea. 
Now, contrary to what some skeptics will say, that this was just sort of a, a marshy area that God sort of dried out so they could trudge across, Scripture tells us that there was a wall of water on both sides. A wall of water, just how you would imagine. And they went through on dry ground. But the idea here is that the Red Sea, even at its most narrow tributary, is about two miles wide. So you're going to have to go with walls of water on both sides, two miles at a minimum. So this is not the idea of, okay, well, I'll trust God. I'm going to take a big, deep breath and just run through it really quick. No, this would have, was a real test of, of their faith. They were going slowly across the floor of the sea. And they've got little kids with them. They've got wagons and, 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 and you know, carts and things with them. They're, they're, they're driving livestock. They're not going to be moving very fast. So just imagine walking two miles, looking on the other side of you, and you see the water piled up on the sides of you. That would have been kind of frightening. But they passed this test. Israel made their way through safely, and they were once again delivered by God's mighty hand. Pharaoh's army was drowned when they tried to follow. So Israel passed that test, and it was a test of courage if they were going to, to push forward and trust in God to deliver them, and he did. Now the next test was less dramatic, but it was more personal. There was a judge by the name of Gideon, and he was given a test of humility that involved water. If you look over in Judges chapter 7, Judges chapter 7, I apologize for having to sort of skim across some of these uh, and treating them in a kind of a summary manner. We'll look at Judges chapter 7 here. Now the Midianites were, were oppressing Israel. God raised up Gideon as the deliverer, as the judge. And they gathered up an army to go fight them. But God wanted them to do something before they went into battle. Judges chapter 7 and verse 2. And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. See, God says, Well, you've got a big army, but it's going to be tempting for you after the battle to say, Well, God didn't really do much for us. We just had this big army, and that was what gave us the victory. So God wants to stop that. Uh, he wants to remove that temptation to take pride in themselves and make them fully understand that it's only God who's going to give them victory. So he says in verse 3, Now therefore proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. And 22,000 of the people returned, and 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them there for you. Then it will be that that of whom I, whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And of whomever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, the same shall not go. So God says, take everybody down to, to the water. And here's what they're going to do. Tell everybody to get a drink. Everybody's going to get a drink. And he says, the ones who, who bend down and put their face in the water and drink, those are going to be the ones who go with you. But everybody else who uses their hands to cup it up like this, Send them home. Seems like a weird thing, but this is what God wanted them to do. And we see that after this, uh, after this, this whittling down, this is going to be God's army. This is not going to be man's army. So God takes them from thirty-two thousand down to three hundred, where the people that have stuck their face in the water. So these are the ones that are going to go with you. And even then, three hundred against an army of, uh, of the, the, whole, the entire Midianites. They didn't have weapons either. God says, you're only going to take a torch with you and a horn, a trumpet. And they were going to light the torches and stick them inside of a jar so they couldn't see the light. And they were supposed to go up and they went on a ridge surrounding the army and they all blew their horn to get everybody's attention. They smashed the pots and held up the torches and it made it seem like there was this great big army gathered around. God put a fear into these people and they started running around and running into each other, running over each other, killing each other in the chaos. And they took off and ran and they fled. So Gideon, the test for him was, is he going to be humble enough to go along with this plan? Lord, you want, the, you want me to base my army upon people on how they drink out of the river? It seemed very strange, but that's what God wanted to do and Gideon obeyed. And he allowed God to provide the victory that he promised. 
not himself, not, not his military might, but God got all the glory. So this was a test of humility of Gideon was going to follow along with God's command. Now there was another man who needed a lesson in humility also, but he was not an Israelite. As a matter of fact, he was an enemy of Israel. In 2 Kings chapter 5, we read about a man named Naaman. Naaman was a general, the commanding general of the Assyrian army, another nation that gave Israel trouble. Naaman's test was that of expectations. You see, Naaman had leprosy. It was an incurable disease, and he had no hope of recovery. But in Assyria's oppression of Israel, during one of the battles, Naaman had taken prisoner a little, a little girl from that was an Israelite. And this little girl told Naaman, she said, Oh, if only you were in Israel, there's a prophet there who could heal you. Well, Naaman's very interested in this, so he goes to Israel, finds his prophet, Elisha. But it's not what he expects to find when he goes. He thinks Assyria is in control over Israel at this time. So they do what, what Assyria says. They are an oppressed people. They are a conquered people. So he is the commanding general of the army who is over all of these people. And he expects, you know, a grand reception. He's going to go and knock on the prophet's door and he's going to fall all over himself trying to show hospitality and be impressed that, uh, that, uh, that this important person has come to visit him. Well, he goes and, and you almost have to picture this where he knocks on the door and, you know, a little, a little, little slot kind of opens up, you know, yeah, who is it? Well, this is Naaman, the commander of the armies of Assyria. I demand to see the prophet. I have leprosy and I want him to heal me. So, like, hang on just a second. So, Elisha's servant, Gehazi, goes back and asks, oh, hey, Naaman's out front and wants you to come and heal him. And Elisha says, just go tell him to dunk seven times in the Jordan River. So, Gehazi comes out there and says, my master just says you need to go down and dunk yourself in the river of Jordan seven times. Elisha didn't even go out to meet him. So he's offended. He's upset. And then he said, and this is what he tells me to do. Go dip, dunk myself in this, in this Israelite river. And he said, this is not what I expected at all. I expected the prophet to come out and make a big show and wave his hands all around, you know, Shazam, and heal me of my leprosy. Impress all of my entourage. And that's not what happened. He said, no, just go and strip the clothes off, wash yourself in the river. But he was mad. He was upset. It didn't make sense to him. The command that he had been given didn't make any sense. He said, this is silliness. This is foolishness. And it's a little embarrassing. The prophet here was giving him pretty short shrift. And he just tells him to go and wash in the river. And he starts to make excuses to himself. He said, well, this is ridiculous. Well, if I just had to wash in the river, right? there's plenty of good rivers back in Assyria, back home that I could wash in that are better than this dirty old Jordan. And one of Naaman's servants says, Lord, if, if the prophet had come out and told you to do some great, important, wonderful thing, would you not have done it? He said, well, yeah. He said, well, how much more when he just simply tells you to go and wash in the river? You want to be healed, don't you? Well, yeah. Well, if you would do this great, big, grand, important thing, then do this simple thing even more eagerly. So he sees the wisdom in that, and he goes and he dumps himself in the river, and he's healed. Because he humbles himself, and because he gave up his, the expectations that he had. It wasn't what he expected. It wasn't what he was looking for. But the question for us is, will we do what God says? When it's not what we expect. When we, we have an idea about something. We have a solution. We want to run it by God. Or we pray to him about a problem. And when God answers those prayers, but he answers them differently than we thought he would. Well, this is not what I expected. This is not what I really wanted to do. If that's the answer that God has given us, we have to submit ourselves and obey what he has said to do. Naaman saw all the wisdom in that. But what about doing what God says when we don't understand? That makes it even more difficult. When we don't understand what it is that God wants us to do. So there was another test by water that Jesus gave to a man who was born blind. We read about him in John chapter 9. The first 12 verses of John 9, the, the apostles come and they find a man who was born blind and they ask Jesus, they say, Lord, did this man sin or did his parents sin that he was born blind? Jesus said it was neither this man nor his parents that sinned, 
but rather he was made blind so that the glory of God might be shown. And then he heals the man. Now what he does is strange because Jesus spits on the ground into the dust and he rubs it together and he makes clay. And then he takes that clay and he smears it across the man's eyes. And he says, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And that's all he said. But we're told that this man, this blind man, goes. He goes to the pool of Siloam. Must have been pretty difficult when you're a blind guy. Maybe somebody helped him. Maybe it just took him a while. But he goes, and he's healed. So this was a test of understanding. Again, doing, doing what God has commanded when we don't understand it. Are we willing to do the same? Are we willing to go where God sends us, not knowing why? This blind man didn't even know who Jesus was. When they asked him later, the Pharisees come up and they say, well, who healed you? And he says, I don't know. Just this man came up, put on put clay on my eyes, and told me to go wash, and I washed, and now I see and they said, oh, this was this Jesus. And he said, well, if you say so, I, I never got the man's name. He didn't even know who Jesus was, and he still obeyed. Jesus didn't tell this man, go and wash in the pool of Siloam, and your sight will be restored to you. He didn't say it. He just said, go and wash. And he did. He went, and he was healed. Great obedience, great confidence. The question then comes to us. Would, would we, would we uh, fail at this same test? Are we willing to go when we don't understand why we need to do this? Or how this is all going to work? We're given the, the command in the Great Commission of Matthew 28, verse 19, to go and baptize and teach the gospel to all nations. We're told to go. Romans 1.16 tells us that the gospel is the power that leads to salvation. How? How does that work? We don't know. We don't have to understand it. We just have to do it. <clears throat> Are we willing to go when we don't understand? Another test that comes to us. There was another test by water that really cut right to the heart. And that uh, that's about repentance. If we look at John's baptism, the baptism of John, that becomes a test of repentance. You see, there was a command that had gone out that all of Israel was to go. And they came to him. We're told that they came to John in the wilderness. They went out to him where he was. The test that God gave him was if they would it was if they would go. Mark chapter one verses four and five says that John came preaching repentance, repent for the kingdom is at hand. That was his message. He said the kingdom is coming, the Messiah is coming. Get ready. So he came preaching repentance, and all of Judea came to him and confessed their sins and was baptized. So the test was if they would go. If they were going to make that trip, if they were going to take the time to go out there and obey the commands that God had given. Repenting and confessing and submitting to being baptized in front of the multitude. Now this would be one thing if it was just, you know, you and one other person maybe. A private matter. But this is public confession, admitting that we have sin, admitting that we need that sin forgiven, and that we can't do it ourselves. That's what was involved. This, that was the test for all who went to see John. Repentance is also called godly sorrow in Scripture. Second Corinthians 7.10, Paul makes a distinction there between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. He says, worldly sorrow is just feeling guilty about it, it's just feeling bad when you do something wrong. Repentance, godly sorrow, he says, is feeling guilt over our sin. It's taking action to fix it. And making a commitment to try not to sin anymore. That's what true repentance is. It's being sorry and doing something about it. Well, those who obeyed John were likely to pass the ultimate test of obedience. That was the baptism of John. Then there's what we refer to as the baptism of Jesus, or a New Testament Baptism, and it's a test of obedience that comes with water. James chapter 2 and verse 14, we're told some things about faith and works that the world really has a hard time understanding for some reason. It's very plain in Scripture, but men have made it difficult and confusing. But James writes in James chapter 2, beginning in verse 14, Which is a prophet, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? 
Can faith save him? The answer that's implied there is no. Without works. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. The illustration there is someone who just says, I have faith, I believe in Jesus, but they don't actually do anything about that. They don't take action to support that belief. It's just as useless as something, someone telling a, a homeless guy on the street, don't be hungry anymore. It doesn't work. It's not effective. There's no, there's no solution there. So loving the needy, even feeling compassion for them, which are good things, isn't enough. The heart must generate actions to meet the need, or it's just empty emotion. A lot of empty emotion around the world these days. Not a lot of acts of obedience. James says we have to have those if, the, if our faith is going to save us. Now, let me make something very clear here. We're not saved by our works, but in a very real sense, we cannot be saved without them. In John chapter 14 and verse, uh, verse 15, Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. The implication there is if you don't keep the commandments of Jesus, then you really don't love him, even if you say you do. In Acts chapter 2, as Peter ends that fiery, convicting sermon on Pentecost Day, the crowd asks in verse 37, when Peter has told them that they are guilty of the murder of the Son of God, and they say, what do we do now? How shall we be saved from the wrath of God? They ask in verse 37, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter tells them in verse 38, repent and be baptized. And in verse 41, of Acts 2 said, those who received his words were baptized. Notice what he says there. Those who received his words, took it in, processed it, owned it, and acted upon it by being baptized. Those who received his words were baptized. Those who accepted his words were baptized. And those who rejected his words were not baptized. It's the same today. It's a test. Are we going to put feet on our faith? Are we going to do what we say we believe? Or are we just going to go with feelings and words? And we're tempted to ask in these times, you know what, why are we saved by baptism? Of all the ways that God could accomplish salvation, of all the commands that he could give us to submit ourselves to, why that way, God? It just doesn't make any sense. Dunk yourself in water, what's the big deal? Jesus told the prophet Isaiah, My ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. What seems logical and reasonable to us may not be logical and reasonable to God. And vice versa. It may be the way that a parent sometimes says, Because I said so. Sometimes you just don't have time for a detailed explanation. Or sometimes you know that the child just isn't capable of understanding the explanation you could offer. So you're just sort of wasting your breath. There's not an explanation that we will understand, and maybe it's the same way with God. He can't really tell us exactly why he chose this way, why it makes sense, but this is what he has chosen. This is the way that we show our faith. We demonstrate it. Just as God demonstrated his love for us in sending Christ to the cross, we demonstrate our obedience in light of that sacrifice by being baptized. It all seemed very weird to us, though. It makes no sense for God to, to test us in this way. But he's in control, and this is how he wants to do things. The question is, will we accept that? All of these tests of faith that we looked at tonight by water require doing something to prove that faith. Everybody in the, all of these examples had to, to perform some action in light of their faith. Action is required along with our faith. But the faith, that part, is hard enough all by itself, is it not? Sometimes just having faith is tough. But the question is, will you trust God, like Noah, that he can and will save you? Will you have the courage, like Israel, to follow God's lead despite your fears? Will you, like Gideon, do things God's way? 
and not rely on your own strength. Will you like Naaman? Accept God's blessings and conditions even when it's not what you expected or wanted. Will you like the blind man? Do what God said to do even when you don't understand how this can possibly help your situation. Like the multitudes who went out to see John in the wilderness, will you go out and confess and repent? Finally, will you accept what God's word and submit yourselves to the commands that he has given simply because that's what he has commanded? Revelation chapter 21 and verse 6, Jesus says there, I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who comes to drink. Will you come? Will you drink? Will you accept the gift of eternal life, the forgiveness of your sins? There's an action that you must take on behalf of that faith. If, you, if there's any here tonight that would obey that command, or if you have questions about it, if you're thinking about it, or if there's something else that you need the prayers of the church for, then make that be known to us tonight as we come and stand and sing this song to encourage you. Please come. Out of my thoughts.